QuickBooks Online 2024 Make Amortization Table. Get ready and some coffee because we're diving into it with Intuit's QuickBooks Online 2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like this CPA thinking cap, for example. CPA thinking CAP, you see what we did with like with the letters? And this CPA thinking cap is not just for CPAs either. Anyone can and should have at least one, possibly multiple CPA thinking caps. Why? Because based on our scientific survey of five people, all of whom directly profit from the sale of these CPA thinking caps, wearing this CPA thinking cap without a doubt, according to the survey, increases accounting productivity tenfold. Yeah, at least. Yeah, apparently the hat actually channels like accounting energy from the quantum field ether directly into your head, allowing you to navigate spreadsheets faster. It's kind of like how in like the Matrix when Neo learns Kung Fu, or at least that's what the scientific survey is saying. So get one because the scientific survey participants could really use some extra cash. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our Get Great Guitars 2024 QuickBooks Online sample company file we set up in a prior presentation. Opening up the major financial statement reports like we do every time. The reports on the left hand side in the favorites. Right click on the balance sheet to open link in a new tab. Right click on the profit and loss to open a link in a new tab. Right click on the trial balance to open link in a new tab. If you don't have that trial balance in the favorites, you can search for it. Let's tab to the right. We're gonna close the hamburger and this time we will change the range, but we want to go out through the second month of operations because now we're in the second month. So we're gonna go from 010124 to 022824 and then run that report. Now note that the balance sheet is as of a point in time. So it's really only showing us what is happening as of the end of February, meaning February 28, 2024. But having a range from January to February could allow us to hit the drop down over here and change it to months and then run the report. So now we can see where we stood at the end of January and the end of February. They're the same right now because we haven't entered any data yet for February. Let's tab to the right. Similar process, closing the hamburger. I'm going to make the range from 010124 to 022824. So now we're going once again for two months, but this report is not as of a point in time, but rather has a whole range to it. So this would include income and expenses that have accumulated upwards up through the two months. I'd also like to see this though on a month by month. So let's hit the drop down, change it to months, run the report. You can see in January, all the activity has happened. Nothing happened in February. And then they give us a total column, which makes sense on an income statement. Doesn't make sense on the balance sheet because the income statement is accumulating over the two month period to get to the total. Whereas the balance sheet is just telling us where we stand at the end of each month. Let's go to the trial balance and do a similar process, closing up the hamburger. And let's do the similar thing, although the trial balance is a little bit tricky here. So if I go from 010124 to 022824 and run that report, now we have the trial balance, which is showing as if it's like a balance sheet as of a point in time, doesn't have a range up top. But it kind of is a range report as well because it's got the balance sheet accounts on top of the income statement. So you can see down here, we've got the revenue and uh, the expenses. So you would think this bottom bit is kind of a range type of report in essence. So let's try to, to break it out. If I hit the drop down and look at it by month and run that report. So now it doesn't give us the total column. It's still treating it basically like a balance sheet. 
and there's no difference between the two because we haven't entered anything in February, but it's still going to be a little bit wonky down here when you try to run a month by month on the trial balance, possibly in part due to the fact that QuickBooks wants to close out the income statement on a year by year basis. So meaning when I go into the next year, that's usually when the income statement accounts will roll into uh, the equity accounts. And it doesn't really do that as well when I go from month to month. So we'll kind of see that. We'll check that out as we start doing data input uh, in February. Just remember that the, the trial balance basically works best typically when it's one, run on a year by year basis due to that closing process that's being used. Okay, that said, let's go back to the balance sheet over here. Now we're starting the second month of operations. So a quick recap what we have done. Started a new company file. We then entered the beginning foundational items necessary to be able to do the normal data input, including everything under the cog or things located under the cog, under the your company, like the account and settings, the users, the payroll, the lists, products and services, for example, and the chart of accounts. We set up our vendors, customers, employees. We then entered the beginning balances as of the beginning of the year, January 2024 or the end of last year, December of 2023. And then we entered our beginning balances we imagined came from the prior accounting system. And then we finally were starting to enter the data for the first month of operations, starting with those transactions typically used to finance the company, to get the money necessary to pay for the startup costs, which typically means you have to take out a loan or you're going to have uh, equity that you're going to put in yourself into the business. Once we have the cash, then we purchased the furniture and equipment that we're going to use to help generate the revenue and the inventory. Then we started recording transactions of actually selling stuff, making money in January. So now in February, we're going to do a similar process continuing on. February should be a little bit easier now because the chart of accounts are all set up. We have a somewhat of a foundation to now copy. It should start to get more cyclical uh, in February in terms of the accounting process. However, we're going to start in February with some transactions that once again are kind of unique transactions or ones that aren't going to be normal all the time, such as, for example, uh, first we're going to be looking at our, in, our, our investments. I'm sorry, our loans here. So now we want to think about managing uh, our loan. So we took the loan out last time. Where is, where is my loan? There it is. So we took this out last time, but now we're going to have to pay off the loan. And the problem with paying off the loan is that there's not just one account impacted typically or two accounts impacted. There's interest that's going to be involved as well. Why is that a problem? Well, that's going to throw off our ability to just use the bank feeds. Because what we would like to have happen is if I took out a loan, let's say we pay it off like we do with a mortgage or something, paying equal monthly payments as, a, as an installment loan or something like that. Well, if I was to do that, then uh, it would be nice if I could just wait till the payment clears the bank, do it with an electronic transfer, then use the bank feeds to simply record the reduction to the checking account and the other side going to the reduction of the loan that is there. But I can't do that because they're going to charge interest. And interest is basically simply the rent of the money. It's, it's just like renting an apartment in essence. You're using the apartment or you're using the office building for work. If you're renting it, you have to pay for the space. Well, in this case, we rented the purchasing power of money in order to get the fixed assets in the inventory that we needed to generate revenue. And therefore, we have to pay rent interest on that purchasing power that we got in advance. So the problem with the interest, however, is that it changes from period to period. That's the cost of us having to have an equal payment, an equal dollar amount payment results in the breakout between interest and principal will be different, which makes the transaction more difficult because I can't memorize the transaction because it's going to be different every time. Same dollar amount but different allocation between interest and principal. There's a couple different ways you can deal with this. One way is that, uh, is that we can make an amortization table and we can just tie it out to the amortization table each payment. Another way we can deal with it is you might say, hey, look, I'm the, on the bookkeeping side, I wanna automate this thing. I don't wanna deal with that problem. 
what I'm going to do is just make it a cash to based system. And I'm just going to record the, the payments as a reduction to the loan payable, even though I know that's wrong, but it's easy to do. And then I'm going to tell my accountant or CPA at the end of the year, hey, you make the amortization table and you do the adjusting entry as of year end to break out the proper portion of interest and the loan balances the way it needs to be for external reporting and possibly for taxes. If you have a good bookkeeper and a good accountant that knows how to do that, it, that system works quite well because then you can actually automate your bookkeeping as much as possible and not have to try to do that process as you go and then just fix it periodically, basically at the end of the year. So other problem is that the loan payable might include multiple loan accounts. So if we have multiple loans, then you could put all of the loans into one loan payable account and then support it with sub ledgers like amortization tables. But internally, it's easier oftentimes to, to have a parent loan account and then break out all the sub accounts of the different loans. Construction companies, for example, often have a lot of loans. Uh, farms might have a lot of loans, right? Because they, they have loans on the equipment that they need to help to generate uh, the revenue. So, so that, that's another thing to think about. And then also the next problem is if we pay these off in installments, then there's going to be a current liability and a long-term liability of the loan because the amount that's due within a year is current. The amount that's due after a year is long-term. So we don't really want to break out the current and long-term portion. However, each time we make a payment because it'll be different every time we make a payment and it'll be more difficult to tie into the actual loan balance if we're doing that on a payment by payment basis. Therefore, once again, I would make one account here for each loan and then basically uh, record everything to that one account and then ask the accountant or bookkeeper to break out the short term and long term portion according to the amortization schedule on a periodic basis, possibly monthly or yearly. Okay. First thing we need to do to make this work though is an amortization table if we're going to make the loan payments according to the amortization table generally. And they might not give you one. Like the, the people that give you a loan might not give you the amortization table. The idea being that you have all the information necessary to create one. That's kind of like the legal requirement basically oftentimes. Uh, and so if, you, if they actually give you one, you might look at how much interest you're paying and be like, what? <laughs> so there you guys. So let's, I'll show you how to make one in Excel, which I think is the best way to actually see what is going on. There's also a lot of online calculators that you can use as well. It looks something like this. I think it's best personally to make the amortization in Excel and then use the online calculator as a double check to make sure everything's lined up because then you can do projections and things like that. But so this is going a little bit outside of QuickBooks. To do this, I'll do this fairly quickly. But I think this gives us an idea of the problems that, that the loans provide, and then it'll help us with our data input. So I'm going to make a quick amortization table based on the loan that we're imagining to be $72,000. So I'm in Excel. We'll, we'll do it an Excel amortization table. So the first thing I do in Excel is I format the entire worksheet. So I'm going to select the worksheet with the triangle. I'll typically right click in the middle of the worksheet and format all of the cells to put the foundational baseline formatting in place, which I usually go to currency, negative numbers bracketed, no dollar sign. And then do we want the decimals? Let's keep the decimals. We'll keep the pennies. And we're going to say, okay. And then I'll put my data over here that I'm going to use to create the amortization table. So what do we know about this loan? I'll make this a little bit larger. And we know that it's, I'm scrolling in, so I'm not, Six two hundred sixty five percent in. We know the loan balance. Loan balance is we're going to say seventy two thousand. I'm going to make the whole thing bold as well. I'll select the whole thing. Home tab font. Let's make it bold so that we can see it better. You don't have to do that, but I think it might be easier to see on the recording. And then a year. We're going to say it's five year loan. Let's pretend it's a five year loan. This would be on the loan document typically. So if they tell us it's a five year loan then we can say, well, how many months is it? Because we're going to imagine that we pay it off in monthly installments, 12 months in a year. So it would be equal to five times 12. That gives us the 60 months we'll have to deal with. 
what's going to be the interest rate. So I'm going to say, what's the rate year? Now, this is where it gets tricky. No, remember that the, whenever we use a normal convention of an interest rate, we usually say it's per year. So, if, so just like a salary, if I say someone earns $100,000, you're probably not going to assume it's $100,000 an hour, right? Or a week or a month. You're going to assume it's $100,000 a year. Not just because it makes sense, mainly, normally, but also because that's just the convention. If someone asks you how much salary someone earns, they often are thinking in a yearly <laughs> context. Same with interest rates. Interest rates are usually in a yearly context, but you can give the interest rate for something other than a year. So in other words, we're going to be paying rent, which is interest, on the purchasing power of, of the money monthly. So why don't we give us the monthly interest rate? Well, the monthly interest rate would be very small. It'd be a small number. So it, it kind of makes more sense to use the convention of a yearly rate because that's just kind of the standard. But we're actually paying it off monthly. So that gets a little tricky. So let's say it's 0.05 or 5%. I'm going to make that sell a percent by going to the home tab, number group, percentify it. So it's 5%. Let's then calculate what the rate is for a month because that's what we're actually going to be paying on a monthly basis, not on a yearly basis. So how can I do that? I can just say, let's take that 5% divided by 12. Let's make it a percent. Looks quite small. I can't even see anything there. So let's go to the home tab, uh, numbers group, and we will percentify it so we can recognize and then numbers and add some decimals. So it keeps on going, but we can put like four places out. So it's about uh, 0.1476 percent, which is a small number. That's why it's not very useful to use in normal language. Although, of course, Excel can see that number quite well. Also note that Excel is going to going to calculate this based on the decimal repeating, not just based on the four digits that are showing. Okay, so then we're going to say we can then calculate the payment. Now, normally they would give you the payment. And it's possible that they don't even give you the rate if they give you the payment because then you can calculate the rate and you might have to back into the rate, right? That would be kind of a shady thing to do, it seems to me, or they might give you the rate in different contents, context. They might say the rate is this uh, and, and then per month when you're normally thinking in years. So you have no idea what that rate means. It sounds quite low but that's because it's per month instead of per year. But now I'm going to calculate the payment though, just to show you the calculation of the payment. And this could be useful if you're thinking about getting a loan, then you can adjust any of these inputs and think of the payment. So the payment calculation, I'm going to start with a negative, which isn't exactly proper, but it's the easiest thing to do. PMT is the function, double clicking on that. Now the rate that we're going to use, I'm not going to use the 5%, I'm going to use the monthly rate. And I'm not going to type it in there. I'm going to put this rate in there because it calculates and it's more than those four digits. Or you could take the 5% divided by uh, divided by the number of months and you get the same thing, right? And then I'm going to say comma and we're going to say then the, so it goes to the next one is the, the number of periods. That's what the NPER stands for. Not five years because we're talking in months. So it's five times 12 or 60, 60 months because the periods are in months. So we have to have these two match. We have to have the rate match the periods. It's monthly periods, monthly rate, comma. And then the present value is the loan balance, 72,000. All right, let's close that up and enter. And there's the payment. So 135873 is the payment. Okay, so now let's, let's, we could do a quick calculation of total payments then. Total payments. So what's this going to cost me over the life just in dollars without considering inflation? And, and, and it's going to cost me that payments times we're going to make 60 of them, 60 payments. So that's going to cost me 81, 523, Okay, so what's the total interest that we're going to end up paying? Well, we, we borrowed 72 and we're going to pay back 81.5, right? So that's the difference between that is the interest, 81.5 minus the balance. So that's nice to know, but it's it's not really that helpful for us for bookkeeping because I need to know the interest per payment that we're having. And and so, you know, so what we need to do then is break out an amortization schedule. So I'm going to make this a skinny 
skinny C and I'm going to put my headers here. I'm going to say, I'm going to put it at the bottom years and then I'm going to put months and then I'm going to say, these are the payments. And then I'm going to say, this is the interest. And then I'm going to say, this is the uh, loan reduction and then the loan balance. Okay, so, so, and you might call this the principal, the loan principal, and then the loan balance, but I always misspell principal. Uh, and so I make it the wrong principal, and then people make fun of me. So I say loan reduction. So then, uh, then notice I put these in two cells here. You could put it in one cell, like loan reduction, but then you get this long cell. How do you deal with that? Well, you could wrap it, home tab, alignment, and wrap it and then center it, but that's cool, but it doesn't make it perfect still. And then it makes this wide cell over here. So if I'm using a table, then I will do that because, because I need one cell to make a table. But if I'm not doing a table, what I'll do is I'll just break it out into two, two uh, things here, two <laughs> rows. And then I can make it look like a header by just selecting this up top and going home tab and I'll make my header font group and make it black and then white. Uh, and then centered, a uh, white over here, and then centered. So now, now, now I don't have to deal with that that fat number one or the long number one. The number one's got a long face like a horse. So then I'm going to put the number of months. So I'm going to say months. There's going to be 60 of them. This is easy to do in Excel though. I can just say zero, one, and then I'm going to select those two. Put my cursor on the fill handle drag it down to 60. You could use a, a function to do this, a fill function too, but I don't think this is that difficult. It gives you that nice little number thing. So we could just go down to 60. Boom, boom, right there. And then that looks good. Now we might not want the decimals on this one. So I'm going to go home tab number. Let's get rid of the decimals so it's cleaner looking. We could even center it, but I won't do that. And then it's useful possibly to know what year we are in as well. So notice if I, if I look at this, this gives me, like if I'm down here somewhere, it's like, well, what year am I in? That also could help us to summarize the data by year as well. So how can I get the year? Uh, well, I could, one way I could do that is I could say, this is gonna be equal and I'm gonna use the round up function and I'm gonna take this number, the months, divide it by 12 and then I'm gonna round it to negative 0.01. Oh man, what did I do? Negative 0.01. And that just tells us that tells Excel the digit that we want to round it to. So I'm going to say boom, and it gives me a one. Let's see if it works now. So if I scroll down, when I get to 13, see now I'm on year two. So that looks like it's doing what I want. So if I copy this all the way down, it gives me the year that I'm in in each row. Note, if you're going to build a table, you want something in each row. I don't want a one here and then nothing and then a two down here. If I'm going to build like a pivot table from it, uh, I want something populated in, in each row. So up top, I could do the same thing and that should give me zero. And then I could get rid of the, now that I have the decimals, I can see it's right. I can get rid of the decimals. So boom, get rid of the decimals. Okay. And then we have our payment. But what I'll typically do is start off with the loan balance. So that's why I like to start off with zero. So I'm going to pull in the loan balance. That's the original loan equals. I'm pulling it from my data on the left. Boom, 72,000. The payments are always going to be the same. We calculated them right here. So I'm just going to say that's always the same. The payments will remain the same. So if I'm going to drop that down, I'm going to select F4 on the keyboard, put in a dollar sign before the B and the six because the payments are the same. And that means it's when I copy it down by double clicking on the fill handle, it's not going to change that cell. The other way you can do that, by the way, which I often use is useful, is you can go to the next cell down, equal the one above it, and then copy that down. So now it just keeps on equaling the one above it. But let's do it. Let's go back to the other way. And oh, the other way, just like, let's say this is going to be this. And then F4, absolute reference, double click to drop it down. Okay, so then the interest calculation. This is going to be the interest per period. 
Now, the thing with interest, it's like rent, right? Even though I'm going to be paying this amount of interest, I haven't incurred it until I actually use the purchasing power of the money. It's like saying you signed a contract to rent an office building and it's going to cost you, you know, uh, $10,000 or whatever, $50,000 a year or something like that. You, that's fine. You, you're locked into doing that. You've committed, but you haven't actually incurred the 50000 because you haven't used the office building yet. Same thing is happening here. We've kind of locked ourselves into this agreement, but the interest, although that's the total interest we expect to pay, hasn't happened yet. So the first month means that the first interest payment will then be calculated. How do we do it? 72,000 loan balance times the, we could take the 5% divided by 12, or I can take the monthly rate. So there it is, uh, $300. Now, if I copy this down, uh, I want I want anything that's in my data set, typically the general rule is I need to make absolute because over here, this cell will follow down as I copy it down. This cell will not. So this is B5. I'll put my cursor in B5, F4 on the keyboard, dollar sign before the B and the 5 so that when I copy it down, it's not going to move that cell down. So I'm going to hit enter, put my cursor back on it, double click the fill handle, and uh, it didn't do it right. K paso. Oh, that's because I have it. <laughs> so that's fine. It still works, but I have to do the rest of it. So then the loan reduction. So if this is the loan payment, which is the same, and the interest for the first month is 300, then what's going to happen to the reduction of the loans? So this minus this, this is how much of your payment of that is going to the reduction of the loan. The difference, $300, is rent of the purchasing power of the money that's just gone so now we're going to say the new loan balance is going to be equal to this minus this and so there we have it so now we have we were at seventy-two thousand, and then we paid this amount 300 of it was interest therefore the loan reduction only went down by the 1058.73 here's the new loan balance if i copy that down we copy this down i can copy this down same thing but now the loan balance is 70941 which means if I keep the payment the same, then which I want to do because that's easy for budgeting. That's why we loans are often set up that way. But then the interest and the, and the loan reduction are different now. So now I have a different uh, amount of interest because the loan balance is different and therefore the rent on the outstanding balance is different and therefore the loan reduction is different and that gives me a different total. So if I copy that down, that's the trend that we will see. Here's the same payment, but notice what happens to the interest. The interest is going down. Why? Because the rent on the purchasing power of the money is less because we have less money that we're purchasing because the loan balance went down last time, right? And so then, and, so, and then the loan reduction amount goes up. So you're paying a lot more interest at the beginning of the loan than the end of the loan. If I copy that down, I can double check this going to the bottom and saying there, if it gets to zero after 60 payments, that's a good indication that we have done this properly. Now I would, we can also check this against online tools. So I could say, let's go into this tool. This is, I'm not affiliated with them or anything, but if you just type in online amortization calculator or something, you'll get something like this. So we have a loan amount, 72,000. I just put 60 months interest rate 5%. We calculated it. There's our, our uh, total uh, payments, which I think we had here, right? We did that. There's that. And there's the interest. Da -da. And then if I look at the monthly schedule, it gives me this monthly schedule here. The first one, 300 on the interest, 295, 290, and so on. Uh, so it looks like we've done it properly here. Okay, so the, the, so that's nice because now when I make a payment, which we'll do in a future presentation, when I make this payment, I can't just reduce, I can't just impact two accounts like, like the loan balance and the, and the cash account. I have the interest I have to deal with and I can't memorize the transaction because the interest changes even though the dollar amount that I pay does not. So that's what we have to deal with next time. Now, also note, if you're looking for long-term planning or something like that, you might want to try to make a table where, where all of this is, is, uh, 
is is in a table, right? So let me show you how to do that. I'll just do it. There's a couple ways to do it. Let's just do it with a pivot table though. I'm gonna put zeros here so that we have zeros. And then what I do is I make this into a table. Now this is gonna be a little bit messy because I made these two columns. So the table headers are only gonna be right here, but that's okay. I'm gonna put my cursor somewhere in here and go into the insert and then tables, I'll make it into a table. I like to have it in a table format and I don't want it to include that top row though. So I, I want it to be from here to here because, because that top row is a header. So that's a little bit messy, but I don't want to include that top row. Okay, so I'm going to say boom, and there's basically kind of a table format from it. Now, now I'm going to take this table, and you don't have to make it into a table first. I just kind of like to do it when I'm, when I'm then going to be making a pivot table for it for some reason. But now we have it in a table. Let's go ahead and then say we want to insert, and this time I'm going to make a pivot table. So from table range, boom. And so now it's picking up uh, the table range. And I think I want to add the headers on it. So I'm going to add the headers so it has headers in the table. So let me pick that up. So I'm going to say, boom, there it is. Worksheet existing. Now I'm going to put it in an existing worksheet. I'm going to put it over here. So now it's in that worksheet instead of in a new worksheet. Uh, choose whether you want to analyze multiple tables. I'm just going to say, boom, that's all I need. And then we, if I pull this to the right, we get this little pivot table thing. So what I'd like to do then is take a look at the years. If I click on them, it tries to sum them up because there's a number in it, but I want the years to be actually in the rows. So now it's showing me the five years. And then I want it to give me the data uh, in terms of payments, interest, uh, reduction of the loan balance and the balance. So I get this nice little table that is created on a yearly basis from, from my amortization table. So then I can close this back out. And then, and then, then notice the formatting of the numbers isn't perfect. So maybe I can go into here and say that I want to say drop down and I want to value uh, field settings. And then I want this to be summing. So that's correct. But I want to edit it. And then I'm going to say currency on the format, negative numbers, no dollar sign. And we'll do that. Boom. Boom. All right. So it's just format. I could do that with the interest as well. So on that column, I'm going to, I'm going to value edit summing summary, and then the number format. I want it to be currency, negative numbers, bracketed, no dollar sign. Boom. Boom. Same with the uh, reduction one. The last one's a little bit different. So let me show you this one. I'm going to say this is going to be, uh, that's good. Summing it, number format, currency, negative, no dollar sign, boom, boom. Now the last one, I don't want it to sum. I want it to show me the balance after a year. So for example, so this one, I'm going to say value. Now this one, I don't want it to sum all the data there. I want it to show me the min number uh, for everything that has a year one in it, for example, which will be the lowest number, the balance at the end of the year. So I'm going to say, okay, uh, hold on a sec. And then I'll format it. So that's good. Then let's format it. So I get the uh, currency, negative numbers, no dollar sign, boom boom and then i can close this out and then let's make these a little bit smaller uh like that and then i can i could once again wrap these home tab alignment and wrap maybe and center and so there we have it so now you can see this is this is kind of nice the payments of course you know are what they are for for uh the year so I can just add up uh, the payments. It's just going to be this times 12, right? If I add up this, you get the 16,304. That looks right per year, but the interest will change per year. So it's a significant difference. So if I look at this, I could say, okay, the interest is 3,304.77 versus the next year, the interest duh, 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 is 
2639, even though the payments are the same. And that can help you with your budgeting because the interest is deductible if it was a business. And, and so it's, it's significant that the interest is significantly different, even though the cash flow is the same. Then the, the, the reduction uh, is going to be different, too, because it's going to be Im impacted by the difference in the interest, even though the payment's the same. So you can see the reduction for the first year is duh, 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 here, 12999 right? And then the ending balance, where are we going to be after each year? So at the end of one year, we're going to be right here, uh, right there, 590002, right? So 590002, and then at the end of two years, where are we going to be? We're going to be right here, 45334, uh, 45334. So you can, you can find online tools to kind of do this as well. But the reason I think it's really nice to do in Excel is that if you wanted to then use this to budget or something like that, or you're thinking about different loan options and so on, then you can actually use this as a template to then uh, uh, to, to, to do your calculations. You can, you can use this to then run a, run a budget on. And if I change any of the data over here, like let's say it was 7%, you know, you, then we can recalculate all this and this table is a little bit tricky. You have to refresh the table, but we can do that pretty easily, right-clicking and refreshing. And then we can use this data to then build basically a budget if we wanted to do that. Let's bring it back to uh, the 5%. And so I think that's actually useful, uh, but we're, we're, let's refresh it back to here. Boom. But we'll just use it to record our calculations. I'm going to put some home tab font group here. Okay, so we'll use the amortization table in a future presentation to record our uh, payments. So that is what we will primarily use it for.